So great to see everyone. Welcome, welcome. If you haven't been here before, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And if you have been here before, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I think we still have some blankets um, if folks are feeling like they want to get cozy in our San Francisco summer weather. Um, there is There is a bathroom in the back and tea. And this evening, we will start with usually far too long of a preamble. And then we'll have a meditation practice and a discussion. And my hope is that, you know, if you want to get tea in the restroom, that maybe you wait um, until the discussion and if possible, not during the practice. And yeah, I'm Eve. I'm a teacher here at the Dharma Collective. And the Dharma Collective is a entirely volunteer run organization completely radical in that way. Um, most centers have um, a kind of a board of directors or a guiding teacher. And there's just something really special about the fact that this is a community run center. And as that, as that, one of the important values here of this community center is to create an opportunity for us to practice together and to practice together with, you know, a sense of as much as possible ease and safety. And, you know, we constellate in a different form every week together. So every week we can kind of renew our commitment to what it takes to create that sense of ease and safety together. And one of the principal ways of thinking about it is the first one of the most important precepts in, in Buddhism, which is non-harming. And that seems pretty easy, right? Like that sounds OK, non-harming. I'm not going to elbow anybody out of their seat. But we think of non-harming even in the most subtle ways, non-harming in how we're listening, non-harming in how we're even ourselves thinking, non-harming in how we speak our minds to one another. Such a beautiful discipline and practice while we're together to try to be as kind into how we are speaking and how kind into how we're listening and how kind and we are to ourselves uh, in our own reflections. So that's that's some of the important aspects of what we want to come here together and um, kind of weave. And in the Dharma Collective, it's our goal that folks feel that they can show up here and um, practice in peace. We have mace at the door so we can be have some sense of safety um, for those in the room. And online we have Jason and Walt protecting us. So thank you both. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an aspiration for us to make this space feel welcoming and safe and engaging. So we're like, not only welcome, but really excited about feedback that you can offer us and, you know, telling one of the many volunteers here or, um, you know, writing us an email or note, whatever feels comfortable for you, or even an anonymous note. So if you don't feel you can say it publicly, because we would love to keep learning and growing. I know we just had a big survey uh, to get some information from folks about, about that. What else? Yeah, it's a uh, it's just a real delight to be here together. Um, and we've been making our way through this incredible book. 52 chapters in, yes, 50 more to go. Um, and for those who have been, <laughs> it, just, it just gets better. Um, and for those who've been here, you know that this is, you know, a compilation of stories of the Buddha. And some of these are true stories like folk tales. And a lot of them are suttas or the teachings that have been stitched together. And tonight we have Arguably, and I'm sure there would be a lot of argument among refined Buddhist scholars, but arguably one of the most important suttas, which is the Satipatthana Sutta. And many of you may be familiar with it. We'll probably get through like maybe one quarter. You know, it's such a rich sutta. Um, the sutta itself isn't described here, but I'd like to read it for us. Um, it's such an interesting set of teachings on how do we cultivate mindfulness. It sounds incredibly obvious because many of us know that word, many of us practicing mindfulness. But when you look at the specificity of apply, first generating and then applying mindfulness, it's so rich. So tonight we'll start with applying mindfulness to the body. And even just mindfulness to the body, there's so many different ways. I just came myself from 
physical therapy and I am extremely aware of where my body aches and hurts, right? One kind of mindfulness of the body is our form body, right? The aspects of our everyday experience from heat and coolness, or maybe having an itch, maybe having your leg fall asleep. That's kind of mindfulness of the form body. And we can also really start to pay attention to the subtle body as we often do here together, that aspect of the body that's some ways in between our thoughts and our body, like how this porous layer of the feelings that we experience in the body, like the resonant sense of grief or anxiety or longing that we actually experience in a very embodied way. Mindfulness of the body also treads into the territory of helping us understand just the impermanence of this body. You know, there's a whole section of the sutta just on really recognizing that this body is already decaying on its way to full decay. Not exactly how we want to start our everyday or meditation practice, but actually incredibly useful just to remember that, you know, this, this body, which most of us, you know, we think of it as the most personal, important thing in our life, rightly so, right? We, we live in it. Everything we experience is through the body. Yet we can sometimes forget that the body is just not only unbelievably precious, <clears throat> it's unbelievably fragile, and there's no way to prevent the reality that, yeah, it's on its way to decay, right? <laughs> Whether we're young or old, it's, it's in that process. And there's something so universally humbling about that level of applying mindfulness to the body. Not to make us depressed or try to you know, do all these life extending injections or nutrition routines, um, but more to really feel a sense of both preciousness. And then also, I generally don't like this word because it's kind of a word of white supremacist culture, but a little bit of urgency in our practice. So not the urgency of, I got to get a lot done to make sure it's done and perfect, but more, wow, what could be more important than practicing? Everything I think is my stable ground is changing. Even this body on its way to decay. Wow, what can I do? Dedicate myself fully to transforming my mind so that I will be ready for the decay of those I love around me and for my own. So that's a little bit of the kind of fire. There's a lot of gentleness in, <clears throat> in our Buddhist teachings and practice, but also quite a lot of fire. Quite a lot of how can we help you um, feel that sense of true motivation for practice. So that's a little bit of my preamble. Um, any questions about that before we get started? Any objections to thinking about our, our body decaying? Some meaningful motivation for practice? Who here is like a big fan of the Satipatthana Sutta? Like this is like your something you love, hang out in. Sweet. We're gonna we're gonna have a lot of converts tonight, I think. Such a beautiful teaching. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna start by reading a little bit of it and then we'll practice with it together. And in this is from the kind of traditional teachings of it. So the, the wording is not exactly designed for the most clarity, but we can unpack it a little bit. So this is on, you know, mindfulness of breathing, contemplation of the body. It says how, so bhikkhu is a word for monk. And in the time of the Buddha, he's calling all of the monks, the bhikkhus. How does a bhikkhu live contemplating the body in the body? Here, O bhikkhus, a bhikkhu gone to the forest, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty place, sits down, bends his legs crosswise on his lap, keeps his body erect, and arouses mindfulness in the object of meditation, namely the breath which is in front of him. Mindfulness, mindful he breathes in, and mindful he breathes out. Thinking, I breathe in long, he understands when he is breathing in long. Or thinking, I breathe out long, he understands when he is breathing out long. Or thinking, I breathe in short, he understands when he is breathing in short. Or thinking, I breathe out short, he understands when he is breathing out short. 
So this is a such a core instruction that is kind of initiating us into this practice of mindfulness of the body through breath. And what's so interesting is as we're breathing, it's probably the most subtle thing to pay attention to, right? I mean, we can pay attention to sound. It's a little bit more exciting, but our breath, my God, like extremely boring most of the time okay. and something that we don't have to pay attention to because if we did, we would not survive, right? Like, thank God it's an automatic process. And so just the power of being close enough to your breath to notice if a breath is slightly longer or a breath is slightly shorter. Mm -hmm. And also specifically here, it's not just um, kind of labeling this is a long breath. It's knowing this is a long breath. So not, not imposing an idea, but kind of receiving, oh, this is a breath that is short. And I know that it is short. There's something so beautiful about how we can develop our awareness by developing a deep knowing from within. I'm knowing that this breath is long and short. And we can imagine how in probably a couple of weeks when we get to the mindfulness um, of mental formations, knowing I am also experiencing an emotion. That's like a, a level even higher than knowing my breath is short or long. So it's like we're kind of getting in with our, our base level training. How can we cultivate this familiarity with something so subtle like the breath? And when we do, it just is our, it's absolutely, it's kind of the, you know, the minimum needed for us to be able to identify and work with everything that comes up, our fears, our joys, our sorrows. Can we actually notice when our breath is long, notice when our breath is short? So simple. Yes. I didn't want to thank you again for something you said last week. Each breath is a perfect journey, a complete journey. A full cycle of meditation. Yeah. I used that with the mindfulness group that I facilitated. Great. I gave you an app. Oh, I can't. I mean, it's not me. It's definitely <laughs> the teachings, but I, I do find that really supportive. So, you know, as we're following our breath, that yeah, each breath that we can follow continuously through the inhale or exhale, that is an entire cycle of meditation, right? And so we string those together and it becomes more powerful. I'll just read one more piece before we get into um, the practice itself. So this first really essential teaching of knowing our breath, knowing our breath and knowing when our breath is long, knowing when our breath is short. And then experiencing the whole body, I shall breathe in, thinking thus, he trains himself, experiencing the whole body, I shall breathe out. Thinking thus, he trains himself, calming the activity of the body, I shall breathe in. Thinking thus, he trains himself, calming the activity of the body, I shall breathe out. Again, so simple, but we will start our practice with that knowing our breath. And then experiencing the whole body breathing. So such a, such a special way. Like often when we're focused on our breath, maybe we notice the subtle sensations of air in the nostril. Maybe we notice the belly rise and fall, but our whole body breathing, it gives a different like kind of um, um, scope of our attention to the body, the whole body breathing. And even if you just take a moment, just by thinking and knowing the whole body breathing. For me, it's almost as though the entire body starts to have more sensations. If you imagine the entire body as like these little, as we did with our last book, these little cells of light or little pixels, I actually start to be able to feel the bottom of my feet and the top of my head. And so when we're breathing in at that level, we're feeling our entire body breathing in and feeling our entire body breathing out. Come on in. Yeah, no problem. So that's the part. And then without, and we're doing that really without any judgment. We're not like, yeah, the body, you know, when I'm breathing in, I don't like the way it hurts over here. I don't, I wish it was warmer over there. We're just noticing and knowing that our whole body can have that sense of breathing. And then we apply as I'm breathing in, calming the activity of the body. So step by step by step. And, you know, I think it's so beautiful for us to untangle and, and look at all these different threads of mindfulness. 
often we say mindfulness, oh yeah, it's paying attention without judgment. But like, what does that really feel like as we apply it? The sense of knowing and the sense of being with, but like, again, being with the whole body breathing and then applying that kindness of calming the whole body as we're breathing. So that's going to be our um, practice this evening. So I invite you to, in the first part of the sutta, it, it emphasizes, you know, going outside and being under a tree. So imagining this room full of beautiful trees, imagining the beautiful trees right up there on Folsom Street. And we have some lovely greenery here. And finding a posture that's really highlighting two primary qualities in our posture. We want to have that sense, as it said in the sutta, of the upright or the kind of um, the, the spine that really feels as though it has the dignity of practice and posture. Sometimes it's described as a spine that's like a, a whole column of stacked gold coins. And sometimes that's also described as the very uh, stem of a lily. So that kind of supple stem holding up the flower, which would be like our head. <clears throat> and as we feel that sense of dignity and vividness and uprightness through the spine, mm -hmm. we can also have a sense of relaxation and ease and calmness through the front of the body. So part of our posture is finding the posture of ease in the face. And noticing where the head is resting on top of the neck. Ideally, we want to have just the most gentle sloping of our chin. So if our eyes are open, they're softly gazing downwards. And you're also welcome to have the eyes closed if that feels safe and comfortable for you. And finding a place for the palms to rest on the lap that is of most ease to the neck and the shoulders. So that might be kind of palms down on the thighs and a kind of established feeling there of being connected to the body and the earth that could be folded in the lap. Really seeing and feeling into this uprightness of the spine. We, we can give ourselves a moment here to lean a little bit to the left and then lean a little bit to the right and then maybe lean a little forward and finding slowly the sense of real centeredness and uprightness coming up from the sits bones and feeling again, almost as though our, our head was open to the heavens above sense of real lightness and openness through the crown. And as much as possible, we invite stillness to our practice. So not fidgeting or moving. Of course, if you're in pain, it's no problem to shift mindfully, noticing how you're shifting and why you're shifting. Part of the establishment of our posture is committing to the stillness. In addition to the stillness of our posture, both inner and outer, 
consider and invite a sense of inner silence. And of course, there will be thoughts and images and fantasies, but an invitation to not have any opinion about them, not need to analyze them or energize them. And of course, there are things pulling us away from being present in the body. We can invite a sense of spaciousness and openness. There's a third part of our posture, so stillness and silence and openness. So if a sensation arises or a thought arises, instead of trying to push it away or force it to be a different experience. Imagine that there is all the space it needs around it. No longer the center of our attention, just one thing in a much vaster field of our awareness. Before we get into our mindfulness of breathing and body, starting with this sense of stillness and silence and openness and allowing ourselves to be familiar with the space that we are in in this moment, feeling the room around us, feeling other beings around us. And so we were calibrating our mind and heart and body to fully arrive in this moment. Just a couple more moments here, inviting these qualities of stillness and silence and spaciousness. And maybe you've noticed that there's a sense of okayness or calm that's here. Maybe you've noticed that there is a sense of anxiety and difficulty here. Maybe another flavor of present moment experience. And considering 
where you are meeting your practice tonight. This is where a motivation or intention for practice can come from. So being curious about the state of the mind, heart and body and aligning an intention of why practicing to what do you want to dedicate this precious time for? It could be something simple, showing up with kindness, learning, connection. Just taking a moment and allowing an intention to arise naturally. Just listening to this question and seeing what comes. What is your intention for being here this evening? Then gently remembering that whatever the intention specific to this evening, our practice is always dedicated to encouraging our own hearts to be more open, our bodies more available, strong, so that we can be of service to the many beings in need of support, and love, and care. This is called rousing the heart of bodhicitta, the very essence of why we practice. Mm -hmm. And gently we'll shift our attention now to the breath. And as we're breathing in, we can know that we are breathing in. And as we are breathing out, we can know that we are breathing out. We could think of our attention like a rider on a horse and the breath is the horse. At first, it may seem that each breath is the same. But in our practice, we apply a more refined way to really notice and know the breath. Notice and know if the breath that is drawing in is shorter or longer. Noticing and knowing that is the breath coming out shorter or longer. We're not forcing our breath. It's in its natural rhythm just observing and knowing its natural fluctuations. Feel a sense 
not of rejection, but of rejoicing when we notice that our attention has traveled away. Rejoicing that we've noticed and that we can return. The practice isn't how many breaths you take consecutively without straying. It's how well you return to the breath each time. And then the body posture of you know, the simple knowing of the breath, really want to feel both those qualities of vividness to be able to notice the breath, but also that ease and pliancy in the body. We don't want our attention to get too tight. So let's continue noticing and knowing the breath as it travels in. Noticing and knowing if it's short or long. Noticing and knowing as the breath travels out. Feel or imagine that this knowing of the breath is so gentle. It's not a labeling. It's not a identifying. It's knowing by receiving. Knowing by just polishing our awareness and attention so that we can really feel this beautiful undulation, these natural shifts of the breath. Learning how to follow our breath is possibly the most important foundation for developing our attention, unlocking our abilities to feel compassion, regulate our emotions, feel spaciousness and openness. Feeling that sense of motivation that the simple knowing of your breath could be the most important thing you've done all day.
Very gently shifting our attention now. Knowing when we are breathing in that our whole body is breathing in. Knowing when we are breathing out that our entire body is breathing out. And applying mindfulness to the whole body. We can experience this the unified field of sensations. As the entire body is breathing in and breathing out. Really feeling this sense from within the body itself. As though our attention and awareness could be throughout the body. Again, remembering every time the mind slips away, rejoice, relax, just return to feeling the whole body breathing in, breathing out. Even one full cycle of this knowing of the breath in and out. It's an entire meditation itself. Our mindfulness is a remembering, remembering what we are focusing upon, bearing in mind this simple objective, knowing our body is breathing, feeling the entire body breathing, recommitting for a moment to our posture. So helpful to have the vividness and the brightness along with that ease and softness. So we can invite that vividness on our next inhale, rising up the spine. And invite a relaxation 
releasing through the exhale. And gently shifting while still attending to the entire body, inviting a sense of calm and ease through the whole body. Simply attending to the body with our mindfulness, inviting calm. It can feel quite pleasant. It can feel quite compelling. As though it were the most interesting and enjoyable thing we could possibly be doing. It can also feel agitating, boring. No problem. Just continuing a bit longer to sustain this practice and continue refreshing each time you get pulled away. In a couple moments, the bell will ring. So we're giving ourselves just a couple more moments here to refresh our practice.
Mm. Considering and reflecting on the quality of the body and the mind in this moment. Maybe noticing how it may have shifted since when we began our practice. And if there's a bit more presence in the body, a bit more stillness in the mind. Allowing ourselves to carry that forward to the rest of our time here together. Thank you for your practice. So how was your mindfulness of breathing and body? questions, reflections. And for folks who are in the room, if we don't mind using the mic so our friends online can hear us, be great. Yeah, breathing. Uh, it was interesting because, I mean, um, I find that when I bring my mind to my to breathing, it becomes so much harder. Mm. That when I just know that it's um, going to be breathing, that it's just smooth and gentle and. But when I start thinking about it, my stomach tenses up. Mm -hmm. I start thinking about my lung capacity. I start um, having a little more shortness of breath. Interesting. Um, So I found that difficult to sort of get past and and sort of then settle back into it. (laughs) And it's just so paradoxical, you know. that's the way that's yeah. what I was fighting with. And how how was it to settle back in? Or how how kind of how did you experience that? The kind of soothing in a way or returning? That's where short term memory <laughs> malfunction. I I I I I then I, I start drifting away and it's just then it then it just starts um going back to normal. Mm-hmm. Um and and but um yeah. I, that's how it just I regulated yeah. by my mind just drifting to something else. Yeah. To just like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then how about the whole body? And the body was, um, you know, when I, when you say your mind to the body and you start feeling that and you still feel the vibrations and breath going into the tiny little capillaries and all, that's um, invigorating. I mean, I definitely felt more energetic Hmm. than I do in some of my guided meditations, just being in the, in the physical, in the body of it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, it's interesting and not, uh, not super unusual, you know, even that phenomena of paying attention to something and be like, how does this work? Like, no, wait, right. Like even riding a bike and being like, is this how you do it? Like if you pay attention, all of a sudden, our confidence gets a little jarred, but I think especially, you know, with breathing, there can be quite a lot of um, tightness or anxiety that we can have with the breath. Um, it's definitely for some people it feels easeful and easy, but I think also, you know, if you've ever been held down underwater, um, it's really breath becomes, it's a very different issue. Right. And that kind of like, 
am I going to get my breath? Am I breathing enough? Um, but it's, it's, we're, we're adding like another layer, <clears throat> which I think in the practice, you know, though the focus of our attention is the breath, I think we can always, especially if we're meeting something like fear, we can always just stop for a moment and recognize the fear. And generally we don't even need to generate compassion for it. Just seeing it, you start to feel compassion for it. You know, because I think I hope that's how it could feel to you. Yeah, well, <laughs> it just reminds you of how much of it's all mind game, like to know that you're going to, you know, um, come back up after that wave holds you down or you're in beat from yoga and, mm -hmm. you know, you can make it to the end of the class or. Yes. Um, yeah. And how much of a mind game it is just to. So like calm you calm calm yourself down in that moment. Yeah. So yeah, no, absolutely. And I do think <clears throat> as we slow down and notice something again, just so unconscious, like breathing, it really, it really can um not only give us a bit of that like flustering of what are we doing, but it can give us, as you say, like almost like that distress tolerance, like learning how to be with um something that might feel hard in the moment and you know, if you can notice the breath and do so with that sense of kind of calm, it's great training for noticing other things that are arising with great calm. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Friends online. Hi, Gina. <laughs> Sylvia. Oh, I can't see you from that far. <laughs> Do you have a comment or question? Yeah. I just want to thank you for the reminder that it's not how you can stay with it, but how frequently you return to it. Yeah. I, I can't believe I forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for reminding me. And I, I was just keenly aware that I was not doing a very good job tonight, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was okay. It's okay. I still found myself, uh, wondering why can't I feel like this all the time? Yeah. And then you reminded me that, oh, if I can just remember what this felt like, then I can always touch back to yeah. it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And I, you know, God, I had a lot of mind movies my, myself, certainly just here and there, but I absolutely felt that sense of kind of my attention being gathered more fully here in the center. And yeah, what a relief that is, you know, it's just a sense of refreshment. Um, no matter how many times the mind wanders to just come back and feel that. And it's such a different quality. You know, we've been doing a bit more spacious awareness, spacious attention in this class. My, one of my favorite things for us to practice. And yet, you know, this is this kind of practice is often called shamatha attention training so foundational you know it's so important um, again for that meta awareness that ability to notice when our mind has wandered what it has wandered to the contents of our thoughts and emotions truly incomparably useful but also in and of itself it's just such a it's a joyful peaceful experience uh, it can offer us not all the time if your experience was not joyful, so distracted, agitated, tired, also not a problem. Um, I do think, especially um, sometimes earlier in our in our practice, it can feel like this forced paying attention to one area just amplifies all the difficulties in our mind, almost to the point where we think actually meditation and mindfulness is making us crazy. <laughs> like it's a really common thought early on. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really interesting that um, when I work with folks that are in pain, 
um, for me to time to focus on the pain. The number one comment said, as soon as I do that, it's just my pain amplifies, right? And especially if it's a um, neck pain, um, but it subsides once I begin to just kind of like take the breath in. Mm. And then tonight reminded me of um, something that I do is um, when you talk about full body breathing, I always imagine a, an infant, a newborn baby, mm. because if, if you ever see a newborn baby breathe, you know, before they're tainted, you know, by the, the world, yeah. all of us, they literally breathe with their entire body. Yeah. You know, they, they kind of like compress and expand and you can see their bellies and their diaphragms and like mm -hmm. their, their, you know, their hands and their arms shake. Yeah. And to see, you know, a newborn breathe, it's, 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 it's pretty fascinating because yeah, they, they, they fully take in a breath, yeah. you know? So when I try to practice that full body breathing, because sometimes again, when you're in pain, it's, it's difficult yeah. because the one thing you want to do is disconnect from that part of the body that hurts. Um, I always try to go to that image of a, a newborn baby. Beautiful. Thank you. And, and I do love like highlighting, you know, the relationship with pain <clears throat> and the body. I mean, it's, it's just so fascinating, right? Cause it's not just the sensation it's like the added part, right? That kind of emotionality that we put on top of it and our meta awareness, our ability to like parse apart. These are the qualitative sensations of pain. And then this is my attitude about it. It's really hard to do that, right? To have our like, oh, this is just breath, but I'm adding onto it this other like anxiety, right? And being able to, again, pull things apart. That's mindfulness. I mean, that's the magic of mindfulness is pulling apart all these different aspects. So tonight we're starting with body and then, you know, we're doing the, the full four foundations here of mindfulness. So to feelings, mind, mental formation. And interesting, these mindfulness practices, they are both training of our attention, really important, training the attention, um, but they're also insight practices. So we do kind of have these realizations like, oh, wow, you know, as I'm really focusing on my breath and my body, I recognize that I'm trying to avoid pain. I'm only breathing on the left side of my body because the right side of my body hurts, right? Or we start to be able to really um, attend to our body. And I, uh, I personally believe that our meditation practice heals the body. Um, I think there's reasonable evidence to suggest that might be true, but this is more or less me speaking as a scientist and more as a first person scientist of my own experience, that just this kind attention to our body, it's enormously restorative. And I think we can just notice and feel that. And um, for any of you who know the science of placebo, the power of our mind is just incredible. And so inviting in that possibility, like this practice is healing my body, it's worth a try, right? And, and we're looking at ourselves. So, okay, I know this is good for my mind. It's training me. And, you know, this is a good practice for seeing how crazy my mind is and learning about it. But what if also we could just entertain the possibility that this practice was healing and restorative for our body? Just really nice. And the last book we did, um, the name is escaping me, but we were imagining, you know, all these little, um, all of the cells of our body as made of light and that we were healing our body with all those cells of light and I found that pretty effective as a visualization tool. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot more to mindfulness than we even um, know at this point in contemporary science, but a lot to look at and observe in our own experience. Any questions or comments online? I think I see Ron there too. Hi. <laughs> All right. Jason, was there any comment there or we're good? So I think there's somebody. Uh, I think so far we're, we're good. I, um, does anybody in our uh, chat want to make a comment? You can unmute yourselves now if you'd like. No pressure. Um, yeah, I just, and also I know, um, 
last time we had just a beautiful discussion and um, didn't get that much into the teaching for the night. And I just wanted to remind us of just this beautiful teaching from last week that really has to do with mindfulness. And the simple story is there's um, one of the times in which the Buddha is teaching and especially teaching children. Um, you see so much sweetness when the Buddha is teaching children. And often these lessons, I feel, are actually easier for all of us to understand um, when he's teaching children. And um, in this case, the Buddha kind of got up to the front where he's supposed to teach and he just takes last week we had flowers here he just takes the flower and holds the flower and like almost everybody in that room just uh this is definitely not a flower you could imagine right uh oh wait i don't know if i can really do this it's kind of beautiful right so he's holding it and most of the people in the room are like what's he doing? Why is he doing that? What's he going to talk? But there was one disciple um, who just started smiling with radiance and the smile he says, and that was uh, Kasapa. He said, Kasapa smiled before anyone else because he was able to make contact with the flower. As long as obstacles remain in your minds, you will not be able to make contact with the flower. Some of you asked, why is he holding a flower? What's the meaning of this? If your minds are occupied with such thoughts, you cannot truly experience it. Being lost in thoughts is one of the things that prevents us from making co true contact with life. If you are ruled by worry, frustration, anxiety, anger, or jealousy, you will lose the chance to make real contact with all the wonders of life. The flower in my hand is only real to those of you who dwell mindfully in the present moment. If you do not return to the present moment, the flower doesn't truly exist. There are people who can pass through a forest of sandalwood trees without really seeing one tree. Life is filled with suffering, but it contains many wonders also. Be aware in order to see both the suffering and the wonders in life. Being in touch with suffering does not mean to become lost in it. Being in touch with the wonders in life does not mean to lose ourselves in them either. Being in touch is to truly encounter life, to see it deeply. If we directly encounter life, we will understand its interdependent and impermanent nature. And thanks to that, we will no longer lose ourselves in desire, anger, and craving. We will dwell in freedom and liberation. So simple. So mindfulness, right? Nothing is in the way of us making a direct contact with life. Whether it's the beauty of this flame or flower, whether it's, you know, being in direct contact with our own breath. If we can dwell in that, and we can dwell in that, we actually understand the insight arises that, wow, each breath is slightly different. Each breath, this last breath I took was shallow. I was feeling anxiety. And this next breath is more easeful because I'm sighing. Like we recognize the ever-changing nature of, of all things, our breath. Um, just so beautiful. Um, oh, yeah. Hi. 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 Nice to see you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kelly. They, them. Uh, Eve, oh, I, last month, I did a media fast, mm -hmm. but it was um, only, it wasn't, it wasn't a full media fast, which would be a dream but it was um all fasting from all unnecessary media mm -hmm. and i found that going through that exercise for 30 days um uh, took me far as far as um being unobstructed so mindfulness and i realized how much media uh just and and actually information yeah. just this unfettered um consuming of information for me yeah. and for my brain um it just is uh is generative of thoughts <laughs> and static and clutter totally. and um so it was a very interesting exper yes. experiment thank you yeah. for sharing that with us that's so beautiful yeah i have done um yeah a media bath i think i wouldn't have called it that but yeah like 
no music, no podcasts, no um, even excess texting. And it is amazing how much brighter awareness can be. And I don't know if you noticed this, but the dream space opens up too. It's almost as though there's like just more clarity of your waking life and your dreaming life. And yeah. yeah. And, and actually when I go to her, one of the first things that happened at the onset of the fast was um, just all of these new creative impulses firing like oh there's a there's a it was one of them was a media project but um it was just uh notable and remarkable how quickly creativity started firing yeah. um by uh not having any digital devices act as one of my appendages <laughs> yes very inspiring dwelling in the present moment right and, and i love this word like dwelling in the present moment i, I don't know um, how that's translated into other languages but you know your dwelling is your home it's somewhere you're it's like you're like inhabiting it it's such a lovely term um so this is uh, dwelling in the present moment. Again, this chapter isn't long, but we're going to go through the Satipatthana Sutta slowly together. Um, in the spring of the following year, the Buddha, so oh wait, yeah, I skipped the last chapter. Buddha had two more retreat seasons. Buddha is now 55 years old. Okay. He um, was his 20th retreat season since enlightenment. And uh, once again, he is, um, moving different places during different retreat seasons and kind of able to support now i think he has 118 different centers so keeps growing every year and uh and then in this <clears throat> in the spring of the following year the buddha delivered the satipatthana sutta the sutra on the four establishments of mindfulness to a gathering of more than 300 bhikkhus in the capital of Kuru. This was a sutra fundamental for the practice of meditation. The Buddha referred to it as the path which could help every person attain peace of body and mind, overcome all sorrows and lamentations, destroy suffering and grief, and attain highest understanding and total emancipation. Talk about an upsell, right? Like, wow, all of it. <laughs> Later, uh, Venerable Sariputta told the community that this was one of the most important sutras the Buddha had ever given. He encouraged every bhikkhu and bhikkhini, bhikkhini <laughs> to memorize and practice it. Uh, Venerable Ananda, who has the best memory of everyone in the Sangha, reported, repeated every word of the sutra later that night. Sati means to dwell in mindfulness. That is, the practitioner remains aware of everything taking place in his body, feelings, mind, and objects of mind, the four establishments of mindfulness or awareness. So it's, it's interesting when we were doing our mindfulness of breathing, some of you may be familiar with like a labeling practice, right? When we're like, you know, noticing the breath or noting specifically kind of we're applying or putting a label on top of just such a different practice than that receiving kind of you're dwelling in the present moment of the breath and you're not interfering in any way. I love labeling practice, super helpful, but just such a different quality. And here to dwell in mindfulness um, in the body. So we're starting with tonight feelings. So what's pleasant, unpleasant and neutral in the mind. So really noticing um, the kind of contents of mind and consciousness and the objects of the mind, often also the obscurations of mind. So first observing the body, the breath, the four bodily postures, walking, standing, lying, and sitting. Bodily actions, such as going forward and backward, looking, putting on robes, eating, drinking, using the toilet, speaking, washing robes, the parts of the body. So it's like not only 
the body in the posture. Many of us sat tonight. You could also do your meditation walking, lying down. So we want to be aware of the body in all these different postures, but then also the body as it's doing all its body things, right? You know, walking and, you know, looking around, putting on shoes, on rope, drinking, eating, like, can we maintain an awareness of the body as the body is moving through the world? And that might be a little different than paying attention to our breath in the body. Really just, can we maintain an awareness of the body in everything we are doing? Maybe. For most of us, we, we dip in and out, right? And, you know, I definitely notice the difference in my day when I remember that I'm in a body instead of being caught up in thoughts. And sometimes the thoughts are, you know, extremely engaging and satisfying and, you know, connecting and communicating or writing in deep focus, but it can be really easy to lose our body. It's one thing to like lose track of our breath. You know, that happens a lot to lose track of your entire body for like hours in the day. Right. We do that a lot. It's really interesting. And also, you know, it's not like this is new. They did this in the time of the Buddha. That's why he had to be so specific about it. Not just your body when you're sitting or lying or walking, but your body, you know, through all these different facets. Um, I'm curious from folks, when do you lose your body? Work. At work? Yeah. What part? Like the whole time or like <laughs> different parts? Definitely computer time. Computer time. Yeah. Being, devices. being in the box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say driving. Driving. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Right? Because you're like forward, forward. Mm-hmm. When I'm very stressed or anxious, I'm very much in my head space. Yes. And then I remember anger and feel my body and then it helps. And I'm just like, listen, and seeing with the same physical sensation. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. So for friends at home, just when stressed and anxious, you know, it's like all the attention is in the head, um, in the thinking and to just drop into the body in and of itself naturally creates a sense of more ease and it helps with stress. What else? What like else to, do you? I'd like to comment here from the, uh, the Zoom uh, that what I notice about my body when I'm especially moving or just kind of trying to get things done as I'm often ahead of myself or not at way I'm really in uh, asynchronous. So I'm like moving too fast and I'll knock something over or I'll, yeah. drop, you know, I'll just be kind of like completely not present in what I'm actually trying to do. And, and that's a really hard one for me to break. I, I, I'm trying to like, just slow down um, and be more mindful about where my hands are moving. And, you know, cause it's, it's really hard to, most of the time I feel like I'm not in sync when I'm just kind of moving around trying to get out the door and dropping my keys and then tripping out this, you know, it's so funny. And I'm, I'm it's like a comedy, you know, I, I need to just slow down. It's like, I'm not going to get there any faster, but yeah. I, I, I really resonate. I think a lot of us in the room are resonating with that. Yeah. So the opposite for me is like when I throw my back out, I'm really hyper aware of my body. <laughs> That's right. Because I know that if I do something, it's going to be like, whoa, but um, I'd rather be aware of it when I, you know, I'm not in pain. So, but yeah. it's just like pain is a really good reminder. It's so true. But it's just kind of like you, you just become so, okay, like how can I move what I do? So, yeah, but it's a, it's a good practice to do when you're not in pain. I know. No, it's, it's, we take it for granted, yeah, right. When our, mind. when our body is moving easily, I like the idea of like, this would be a tough one, but even for like a weekend or maybe just one day, no rushing. Like that's a, such a different way to be in your body. Right. When, and I think kind of Jason, you're talking about like getting out of the house. It's like everything that can contract will contract. It's like, oh, and you're just like, um, and yeah, it is, it is like a, it's a very, it would be a very interesting practice 
Yeah, I think for me, as uh, someone who likes to, you know, optimize my time, I, it would require me to add like 15 minutes to everything. I, I've thought about this. I haven't executed it, but I've thought about it a lot, you know, like what would it actually take? And it's like, it would take like more hours in the day to do the things I try to do. And like, what, what does that look like? Um, Cause it is, you know, the cost on, of not being in our body. It's not just that it's a nice thing to do. And you know, not only that we might knock stuff over, but we really are like perpetuating the habits of mind, right? And usually these like habits of mind that are rumination towards the future, towards um, overactivity. If our mind and our body are in the same place, generally speaking, unless we're in acute pain or danger, that's a good place to be Mm -hmm. wherever we are. And the interesting thing about um, being in front of the computer, I know I've mentioned this here before, but there is some good research on um, you know, the impacts of like Zoom fatigue and, and the disembodiment is real. And a lot of that is because we're like over amplifying ourselves to be seen and heard. So I think, you know, I, I really respect all the folks who are just camera off so that you're not like, hi, hey, like I'm here, I'm participating, right? And this is a hopefully a low stakes environment of participation. But in our work context, like we have to like over amplify and that's emotionally exhausting. And also we are really like not attending to our body because our body is not literally in the frame. So it's, it's an interesting thing of like, how do we get back into our body? I'm like totally that nerd um, who has a walking desk. I know. Sorry. It's real. Um, And it really helps. You know, I noticed the difference for myself of just like having some movement in my body through the day. Um, So any way that we can get that re-inhabiting of the body. Um, Okay. Do, do, do. Mm-hmm. Okay, so first he's observing, going forward, backward, looking, putting on robes, eating, drinking, using the toilet, speaking, and then the parts of the body, hair, teeth, sinews, bones, internal organs, marrow, intestine, saliva, and sweat. The elements which compose the body, such as water, air, heat, and the stages of the body's decay. From time it dies to when it returns to dust. Um, I remember Mace led this beautiful body scan meditation of our internal organs years ago. Do you remember that? You know, so it's this observation uh, of the body. We can do the outside of the body, right? Um, but I also love this idea of really imagining like our own viscera. It's just not something we get into very often. A part of our body practice could be like this one that that Mace led where you're really thinking about, um, you know, what is going on in our bodies. We are so disconnected from that and it's okay. It works on its own, but so interesting to kind of bring our attention and awareness to just the almost, we could say, miraculous internal architecture of this body at the level of our organs. And then, as I um, said in the very beginning, to really pay attention to the stages of the body's decay from um, the time it dies to when the bones turn to dust. So not only watching our own bodies age and decay, which Zoom also helps us with a lot, <laughs> to like see it all the time, like so unkind. I need much better filters. Um, but I, I, but like also just, you know, really imagining it's, it's so unusual, but really imagining when I'm gone, when all the people I love are gone still going to be this world like not us none of our reference points i had um i had a really i think i must have shared this when i was teaching here but i had a a near-death experience in 2019 with fire ants and so i um got to experience almost dying and and then re-inhabiting the body and i really had a sense of the preciousness of the body stayed with me for months and that realization of like I could have been it, you know, it was so fast. I was really lucky that medical care was available. Um, and I felt 
such joy. And you hear that so often from people who have near-death experiences, right? They, it's not, this is also can be the case, but it's not that like they then lock themselves indoors so they can never be in harm's way. It's like a, wow, what a gift. Just no idea that I get to be alive again today. And I had a really cool experience of, um, I think it's cool, of dreaming of dying um, for the next uh, four weeks, almost every week. And then once a month for six months, it really stayed with me. And the one thing I would imagine in the dreams was coming back. Uh, I had died, but coming back and seeing all those I loved moving around the world. And just the longing and sorrow of that and what that is like to imagine either in the dream world or in our everyday waking life. What is it like to imagine this world without us? Not in a morbid way, but just in this, how can we get really down on the ground with the reality? And again, a little bit that this can also help promote our desire to practice, not because meditation practice will prevent us um, from dying, um, that I will go, I said it healed the body, but I'm not going to say it prevents us from dying, not, not, um, but it is such powerful preparation for when we are facing death, right? When we are facing the death of, um, our loved ones as well, learning how to like have a sense of recognizing the impermanence of life, knowing how to be with distress and difficulty, knowing how to kind of show up and be focused. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so then a, a little bit more here while observing the body, the practitioner is aware of all details concerning the body. For example, while breathing in, the practitioner knows he is breathing in, breathing out. He knows he's breathing out, breathing in, making his whole body calm and at peace. The practitioner knows they are breathing in and making their whole body calm and at peace and walking, knowing they are walking, sitting, knowing you are sitting, and performing all these movements, putting on the robes, drinking water, knowing that you are putting on the robes and drinking water. The contemplation of the body is not realized only during the moments of sitting meditation, but throughout the entire day, <clears throat> including moments when one is baking, eating, or washing one's bowl. So that's like the first area of teaching on on the body the next one that we hit with <clears throat> is the contemplation of feelings um the feelings as they arise as they develop as they fade and that um, these feelings can i love the way it's described here feelings can have their source in the body or the mind so we can have a <clears throat> emotional response to our thoughts. Um, we can also have emotional response to something going on in our body. When we feel pain from a toothache, we are aware that we feel pain from a toothache. When we are happy because we received praise, we can be happy. We can be aware that we are happy because we received praise. The practitioner looks deeply in order to calm and quiet every feeling, in order to clearly see the sources which give rise to feelings. The contemplation of feelings does not take place only during the moments of sitting meditation practice throughout the day. So next week, we'll talk more about the contemplation on feelings. And I do think it's, it's such a natural bridge from the contemplation on the body and noticing, <clears throat> again, like when we can actually be present, what's going on in our body, and when we can actually have that realistic understanding of what the body is temporary, fragile, decaying, also wondrous, enjoyable. The, the idea isn't to, um, some of you may remember earlier in the book, the Buddha tried to reach enlightenment through what's called like mortification of the body. He tried to reach enlightenment by refusing to eat, you know, barely drinking water, just, you know, <clears throat> almost as though you were denying the very needs of the body to reach spiritual attainment. Realize that that was actually not a way of honoring the body. It was too intense. So we don't want to completely remove our sense of enjoyment or presence in the body, but just this middle way or this recognition that it is, I think, I can't remember if it's Jack Cornfield or, um, John Cabot's in one of these <clears throat> elder statesmen in modern mindfulness, kind of they call it a rent a body, 
right? It's just your body for this lifetime. And then you give it back and then you get another body in another lifetime. And just this um, way of starting to not get so obsessed. It's interesting. We think of embodiment. What does embodiment mean? Does it mean we have like perfect abs and like awesome deltoid, you know, is it like the, you know, over identification with the physical form? Like that's actually not embodiment, right? It's, it's, you can have really nice abs and be a great practitioner, but <laughs> not saying, but often there's like an obsession with the form of the body, but not like a real feeling for the body, not a true awareness of the body. It's like a sculpting of the body, but not, you know, inhabiting in embodied awareness includes awareness of, yeah, the decay. And um, yeah, it's just a really interesting one to feel. And I wish it didn't take a near death experience to give us that sense of just the deepest preciousness. Like, wow. I have a, a friend and um, he's a really beautiful, dedicated practitioner. Some of you know him, Ryan Redman. He's come with me a couple of times here. And every night, um, him and his partner really try to take into account the, the fragileness of the body and human life. And every night before they go to bed, they say, you know, I love you. And I hope I wake up in the morning to be another day with you, but not an expectation of that. Right. But just that and recognizing that we don't know and giving us that sense of preciousness in the body. So um, maybe we will close with a little reflection on this preciousness. So we could imagine our attention filling the body as water fills a vase. It's completely inhabiting the body with our attention and awareness. And considering this body it's so familiar to us, and yet we may not really deeply think and know the body. It's considering the incredible inner architecture of this body, the bones and the muscles. And the blood running through us, the heart, the lungs. It's the complex of organs within the gut. Recognizing the body as the staging ground for literally every experience all of our sensory experiences and the mind. And with great tenderness, recognizing that this body was born and this body will die. And from that, feeling the motivation of how we would like to dedicate our time, our energy. And starting with dedicating the, the benefit of our practice tonight. So with this precious human life, considering that if there's anything that we could imagine being of benefit to other beings from our time together. Can we imagine that this benefit could radiate out in many, many directions? 
and dedicating our heart and attention to the possibility that our time here together could allow other beings to feel peace and at ease, that our practice and time together could generate the possibility that other beings would know true happiness, the causes of happiness, and that our time, intention, and efforts here together could help in the liberation of all beings. Thanks, everyone. So glad we're live here together tonight.